Welcome to The Definitive Rap, where we report the truth about American exceptionalism. We love our flag, we love our country, and we believe in America. The Definitive Rap, where we respect people of faith, the men and women in blue, and our support for Israel. And now your hosts, Bela Sebro. She's the nice one. And Alan Skorsky. Uh, he's not so nice. But together they are the definitive rap. I'm Alan Skorsky with my co host, Bela Sebro. And welcome to the definitive rap podcast. As always, we thank vinnews.com for hosting our show. Today's show is different than any we have done before. Our guest, Dr. Bernd Volschläger, whom Bela will introduce shortly, is a man of incredible moral character, strength, integrity, and, and determination. He is a man of great compassion for his fellow human being and a man filled with positivity and focus. Dr. Volschläger, who grew up as a Catholic in Bamberg, Germany, is the author of A German Life, Against All Odds, Change is Possible, which describes his struggle growing up in Germany in the shadow of his father, a highly decorated World War II tank commander and Nazi officer. His life took a big turn while watching the television coverage of the Munich Olympics in 1972. He eventually converted to Judaism, emigrated to Israel, and served in the IDF as a medical officer. I will leave the rest of the story for Dr. Volschläger to tell in his own words following Bela's introduction. Thank you, Alan. The heroes today with regard to the, atrocity, the atrocities of Holocaust victims are those who were not born Jewish, but have made it their mission in life to repent the actions of the German Nazis, especially when it involves a family member. Our guest today, a hero, was part of the post-World War II generation in Germany who grew up learning about the extermination of the Jews. And all it took was finding out about the Israeli athletes who were murdered in Munich for Dr. Bernard Walschlager to intellectually ask, why the Jews? Dr. Bernard Walschlager is a board-certified family physician in private practice in Aventura, Florida. He received his medical education in Germany and Israel and completed his residency training at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami, Florida. He received additional training in addiction medicine and is a fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Dr. Walschlager also serves as a clinical assistant professor of family medicine at the University of Miami School of Medicine, the Florida International and the Florida State University College of Medicine. He's a former board member of the Florida Academy of Family Physicians and is the past president of the Dade County Medical Association and the past president of the Florida Society of Addiction Medicine. In 2012, Dr. Walschlager was honored as the FAFP Family Doctor of the Year. Dr. Walschlager, welcome to the Definitive Wrap. Well, thank you very much. Who am I talking about? I don't recognize <laughs> this guy. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, we want to hear your story in full detail. And I urge our audience to purchase your book, but so that we get a flavor of who you are and how you came to be acquainted with Jews. I understand that as a young boy, you used to assume the role as Shabbos guy for the small surviving Jewish communities in Bamberg, Fla uh, Frankfurt, and Munich. Please tell us about that and about your spiritual journey to right the wrong. Well, thanks, Bela. Uh, now that you talked, told everybody about everything, uh, we can go to these questions and answers. Yeah, well, it's not so easy, I guess. <laughs> well, thank you very much for allowing me to share my life story. And uh, I want to make it in a conversation kind of style. And if uh, anything is uh, further needs to be uh, evaluated, we can do that with questions and answer afterwards. So how did it all happen? Well, first of all, I never intended to go on a book tour or write a book or do anything commercial with my life story at all, because I didn't talk about it for many, many years. Um, there is a combination of factors that probably also shame, guilt, <clears throat> and the inability to express something that others wouldn't understand anyway. Until my son Tal, he's now 32 years old, he's an attorney, I tried over it for a while, but attorneys are people too, that's a joke. 
uh, he, <laughs> he asked me when he was 14, 15 years old, a simple question. Father, who is my grandfather? Abba Mir Sabashili in Hebrew. And that was actually a question that anybody can answer easily in two seconds. Well, in my case, not. Because how can I explain a nice Jewish boy with a Jewish education in a conservative school, fill in in the morning, keep uh, the whole nine yards? How can I explain to him that his father, yours truly, is Jewish, is an Israeli, and served in Israel Defense Forces? And on the other hand, my father, his grandfather, was a highly decorated, high ranking German tank commander and Nazi and National Socialist. So these worlds ob obviously do not reconcile. That, that took some effort. And what I told my son is approximately what I'm going to tell you, um, because over the years I got more information and I got deeper in the material that was made available for me. So every life begins with where you're born. And uh, I was born in a gorgeous city in Germany called Bamberg. I'm not making advertisement uh, announcement for the Bamberg tourism industry. They couldn't need it. But it's a thousand-year-old city, untouched by any wars, nestled between Nuremberg and Würzburg in the north of Bavaria called Franconia. And is modeled after Rome. Seven hills, crowned by seven churches, a massive cathedral in the center of town. A history as little you can touch, smell, and, and listen to history, nothing changed. And so as children, we were... We were educated to appreciate history, naming who lived where, the only Pope buried outside Rome, buried in Bamberg, and so and so. But something as a little munchkin, about eight, nine years old, I noticed there is something not kosher, not that I used that term, because the time frame between 1933 and 1945 was taboo, was not touched. So it was not even talked about. I knew as a child that there was a war. Why? Because there were American soldiers, about 15,000 American soldiers with family members stationed in the outskirts of Bamberg and living also in Bamberg, uh, which had a population of 70 to 75,000, so a very significant part of the social fabric. And I figured if there are foreign soldiers in town, in that case American, and there was a war, we probably didn't win that one. So that was the only thing that I figured. So there was a war and we lost. Uh, at home, nobody talked about the war. When I mentioned and asked a question about war, it was curiosity. My father answered, uh, we're moving forward, we don't look back. And his accent indicated, and he, he didn't speak the rolling Franconian Bavarian la language that, that he did, that, I, that everybody spoke. He didn't. He was a very, very conservative Hochdeutsch, the educated German from the uh, out of Berlin area. Neither did my mother talk Franconian. So when I asked both of them, who is my, my grandfather? I, because I had none either, I was told they're gone with the war. So there was a war, shattered and broke families apart, and nobody wants to talk about it. But slowly but surely, I, because I was nudging, he, I heard two different stories from my father and my mother. When my father started talking, he didn't ever stop. We had long walks in the forest. He was a hunter. And he told me how to handle a rifle, how to fish, just everything. We had a great relationship. And he told me the story that he was the youngest German tank commander serving in an elite unit under the umbrella of General Guderian, the father of the German Blitzkrieg. And my father's elite unit were the first to push in through Poland in September 1939, in 1940 pushing towards uh, Paris and in, in, in France and Belgium and Dunkirk and Holland. And then in, the, in 1941, the fatal attack on the former Soviet Union in the summer of 1941 where my father's tanks, just two or three, pushed so far in, uh, east that they reached a city in uh, cr close to Moscow called Orel and conquered it. And for that unbelievable accomplishment, he was awarded the Knight's Cross by a man who we personally received the Knight's Cross from a man he may adoringly refer to as Mein Führer, my leader, Adolf Hitler. So I had no idea who Adolf Hitler was because nobody talked to me about it. I just knew my father's the knight in shining armor. And his war buddies who came to visit our house at least once a year, celebrated him with a lot of drinking and ali hello, ce celebrated him and told me all the time, impressed upon me, your father is a hero. Arthur is our, his first name. He is a hero and you have to be proud of him. So a little munchkin, I was proud of my father, the hero. On the other hand, my mother told me a completely different story. She was an born as an ethnic German, a Sudeten German in Czechoslovakia, 
in an area that was called the Sudetenland and the border between Czechoslovakia and Germany, uh, where for hundreds of years ethnic Germans lived and were considered Germans and uh, as such due to the war were under threat. My, my grandfather was a well, maternal grandfather was a wealthy merchant, could afford to buy a beautiful villa. And this picture of the villa is the only thing that my mother and my family could rescue because they had to flee. My grandparents, maternal grandparents died as a, as, as a result of it. And my mother was, got a, a gun for my father, handgun and said, when you flee and you know the Russians coming close to you, shoot yourself. So it was a trauma for her, no question in my mind. And for the rest of her life, she just told us children over and over again what she lost. So these two stories, heroism, battle, honor, and then on the other side, horror and pain and loss. But it was something unique in the house that we were living in that connected to history. We lived in this massive 19th century style patrician, build, patrician style building in downtown Bamberg, which is still standing by the way. The entire floor was occupied by the landlady about the field or the size of a basketball field. And uh, we lived downstairs. And my mother always told me, do not talk to the lady unless you're spoken to. She's a countess, an Gräfin. And I said, well, then I don't. And uh, when in the hallway of our part of the building, right next to the door on the left side of our apartment and right next to the right side of the wooden stairway leading up to the uh, apartment of the landlady, the, the uh, Gräfin, was a larger than life picture or painting mounted on the wall depicting an officer like my father, whose pictures I saw at home. Uniform, officer's insignia, the knight's cross around his neck, officer's cap. And when I asked my father who this man was or is, my father responded, he was a traitor, a fine verreter, a traitor. And later I found out from the lady upstairs that this was a portrait of her late husband, Count Klaus von Stauffenberg the German colonel who was leading the assassination attempt on Adolf Hitler on the 20th of July, 1944, which unfortunately failed. He was executed with dozens of other conspirators that they were called in Germany. The same night they were all executed. His wife was uh, thrown in a concentration camp two days later. His children given up for adoption and then sent to Buchenwald for, to be gassed. And uh, due, to, due to the luck of Stauffenberg, she delivered a baby in the concentration camp Ravensbrück, protected by heroic German officers who kept her alive. And the children were rescued and they moved back in the house and uh, lived there. Now they had grandchildren and whenever my, my parents didn't want me to play with upstairs or go to have any contact with her, but whenever my parents had a nickerchen, we say in German, a sleep, sleep after Sunday lunch, everybody was sleeping. I sneaked upstairs because I heard the grandchildren playing. And I remember this apartment the size of a basketball field was covered wall to wall with pictures of her, Nina von Stauffenberg, with her husband, Klaus von Stauffenberg. Picture of love, adoration, positive, of emotions. I asked myself, how can my father be so angry about this man? And how can when two men look alike, they did something so different? I was confused. And in school, I was about 12 years old. We started to talk about the time from 1933, 1945, in a sanitized version, at least in our school. Uh, 1933, Adolf Hitler, who was elected to the German parliament, was appointed as chancellor by the previous chancellor, uh, by the prime minister and by the uh, Reich's president, the president of Germany, Hindenburg. He immediately turned Germany into dictatorship. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people winded up in concentration camps when they didn't agree, that we were told. The Nazis started the Second World War, as a result, 50, 60 million died. Among them, 6 million Jews and other minorities. And then on the 8th of May, 1945, the Nazis capitulated, or Ribbentrop capitulated, Hitler killed himself before. And the Nazis disappeared as if Huns invaded and, and left. That was, of course, a bunch of horse manure. That was not the true story, but it was something to sanitize and bridge the gap. And then came in 1974, in 1972, an event that changed everything for me and for many of my German fellow compatriots. The Olympics in Munich. Now you will ask yourself what well, Olympics in Munich was a set of a great event, it was. Actually, we were tr literally educated on the, big, in the, the year pr prior to the Olympics to appreciate that Germany has accomplished, that Germany was now a thriving country, a democracy, accepted among the nation, except East Germany, the other side was under Soviet dictatorship, communist Germany, but the West Germany 
it was le led by a chancellor, his name was Willy Brandt, who was elected in 1969 uh, to, to the position as prime minister. And he was different to any of his predecessors because he was not a former Nazi, he was a socialist. He escaped Germany in 1933, uh, escaped to uh, Norway, then Norway was occupied, he escaped to Sweden. And from Sweden, he returned to Germany to rebuild the Social Democratic Party was called, and was elected in 1969 on a grand landslide, mostly by young Germans, first generation. And uh, he made it a point to reconcile and to append and to admit what Germany did. And what, that's what he did in December 19, in December 19, um, that was 1970, he traveled to Poland prior to the resumption of uh, diplomatic relationships with West Germany with Poland. And in front of the Ghetto Marshall Memorial in Warsaw, he sank on his knees, bowed his head and asked for forgiveness. That picture of a German chancellor repenting, asking for forgiveness went around the world, front page newspaper. My father threw the newspaper on the breakfast table we read it every day in the morning, but this time he slammed it on the breakfast table, yelling and screaming, look again a traitor. Now I was a little bit confused because I was a traditional Catholic. For me as a Catholic, my mother was an Orthodox Catholic. Somebody kneeling in front of memorial, kneeling in general is a positive sign. It's something positive that we do that in church all the time. Why is my father so livid? My mother sent me to, and my, parent, my father did it, agreed to it. Uh, sent me to a Catholic kindergarten, Catholic school. I was an altar boy. My mother wanted me to become a priest. It didn't work out. Well, it was never too late. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, for, because of that education, I didn't understand why my father was so, so mad. And the same chancellor with this tremendous moral standing in the Western world opened the Olympics on a beautiful August day to a great fanfare. And uh, to the occasion, my parents purchased the first TV, black and white though, invited friends over, fine food, wine, beer, champagne, everybody was joyous and laughing and cl clapping when the teams paraded into the stadium. And suddenly a team paraded into the stadium among the other teams, carrying a flag with a star inside, the Israeli team. And the adults felt silent. Nobody said a word. It was the do not ask the question moment. And I was like, that's weird. That's another team. It could be Sweden, Switzerland, whatever. I had no idea what that meant, but why the adults are so silent and obviously something happened and the same team that's a proudly paraded into the stadium and this beautiful august day in 1972 was 10 days later attacked by a group of palestinian terrorists belonging to an elite unit of the plo we know now and it's not propaganda that the east german security service the stasi guided them logistically had actually an apartment next to the apartment across the uh, building uh, for the israelis were housed and watched the israelis and gave logistical support to the terrorists the terrorists uh, butchered two Israelis on the spot. The re remainder were taken hostage. And the German government, shocked that Jews were killed on German soil, dispatched highest ranking government members, among them the Minister of Interior, negotiating face to face with the terrorist leader, Isa. And the German, uh, forum, uh, the German Minister of Internal Affairs, he asked them, begged them, let, ta let take me and others as hostages, the whole government if necessary, but let the Israelis go. The ISA did not agree. He clearly articulated his demands that he wanted to be flown out with the Israelis uh, to a military airport outside Munich. And from there with a, with a German Boeing 707 to be flown to an Arab country of their choice to be revealed. And, in a, and Israel has to relieve 270, release 270 to 280 prisoners in from Israeli prisons, mostly Palestinian terrorists. And that should be a great fanfare and should be accomplished probably in Cairo or Tripoli and it didn't happen the way he wanted it. Two helicopters, and I remember the, the event, it happened yesterday, two helicopter took off from the Olympic village with the Israeli hostages and the terrorists equally divided between both helicopters, landed behind the, the gates, the closed gates of a military airport outside Munich called Fürstenfeldbruck, and then all hell broke loose. The firefight started suddenly, lasted for over an hour, explosions, subsequently explosions with huge fireballs that, that turned the, the dark sky to, to, uh, to daylight. And then silence. And about three o'clock in the morning, a American journalist turned to the audience, exhausted and revealed, they're all gone. Simple statement, they're all gone. What happened is that the German police tried to liberate the hostages. The Israeli units on the ground, Mossad uh, Kidon units, special units, 
together with Tzvi Samir, the head of the Mossad, begged the Germans, do not attack. These are elite soldiers. They need to be treated, dealt with in a completely different way. Do not shoot. Let us do it. The Germans refused and did it themselves. As a result, when Isa and his gang was surrounded, they knew that the Boeing 707 had no pilots and no staff on that if they, it was empty. They decided to end it. Isa threw a hand grenade in one helicopter where all Israelis perished alive. The other helicopter, somebody, probably him too, sprayed with machine gun fire and everybody died. And the next day, these iconic pictures in all over the world and in the German newspaper specifically in, in our hometown too, the picture of two helicopters, one burned out with the charred remains of the Israelis inside, the other helicopter with the bodies of the Israelis slumped over the seats, and the huge headline, Jews killed in Germany again. Now I speak perfect German even now. Again means that something happened before. And I asked my father and I came home, what happened? But what is the significance of this event? My father was yelling and screaming, diese Juden machen unser Leben wieder kaputt. These Jews destroy again our reputation, our life here in Germany. Always trouble with them. We, we try to keep, cut them out, but they always come back. That's their fault. So the victims as perpetrators, the perpetrators as victims. And I didn't understand that. I mean, this, how could my father be so callous? And in school, we started to talk about it as a result of this event. We started to talk about everything. And in the absence of a Holocaust curriculum, our teachers started to talk about their lives. Some cried. They broke down in front of us. And what I heard, I never heard before. Auschwitz, Birkenau, final solution, the murder of six million, not as collateral damage of war, but six million targeted and executed by decision made by the German government. Uh, Eichmann, Mengele, the murder, Hitler. I mean, I, I was overwhelmed. And my way back home, I remember I said, my father, the war hero, he must know something. Maybe more that he can answer questions. When I came home, I said, dad, actually, I couldn't say dad. I could only call him father, the formal term for father. I could not kiss him. I could not hug him. It was forbidden. For, forbidden. So I asked him, what happened? We talked about the Holocaust in school. My father looked at me. Very cool been very relaxed. Holocaust? It's a lie. Your teachers are communists. Never happened. In our house, we don't talk about it either. All lies. And here I was caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, my father, whom I feared and respected too, uh, told me the story that is a lie. On the other hand, my teachers, whom I respected, told me that's, that is true. So what is, what is the truth? And I started to read as much as I could about that time. Published in German, in English, in French. And I had to, I, the, what I read was horrible. And I asked myself, I need to find out the truth. I mean, my father, if my father was all this, this war hero, this knight in shining armor, I want to find out from him what happened. So I know talking to him was a little problematic because he wouldn't talk about it, but he was an alcoholic. And as a child of an alcoholic parent, you gauge the first phase during the day when you're looking for a drink, he's restless, irritable, and discontent. The third phase during the day in the evening, he's drunk. And in the second phase, the twilight zone, I call it, I call it nowadays the shikar zone, he is uh, kind of, he talks and, and gives money and you could manipulate him. And I used that time, this specific twilight zone to ask questions. And the question I asked over the course of two or three years, over and over again, first set of questions, father, what happened? I said, well, burned whatever allegedly happened. So I already admitted that something happened. Allegedly happened. We didn't do it, the Wehrmacht. It was all the SS. Well, that was, that was, that was a lie. I found out the right written in books. The SS and the Wehrmacht did not collaborate on tank tactics. They collaborated on killing, kill zones. I actually found a picture 20 decades after his death. The archives were opened in the East. An historian gave me several very important documents uh, to talk about it. One of them, a picture of my father, a Lieutenant Colonel, sitting next to Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, the beast, in Russia in 1941, 42. When ranking German officers, tank units, met with the head of the SS, the beast, it was about securing territory for kill zones. My father knew exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. He knew also about Auschwitz because in the same term, my historian found a document, his denazification protocols of my father, where a letter was affixed to it, where my father, a letter, an order that my father gave 
to send about 600 or 700 Russian prisoners of war to a place called Birkenau for final treatment. He knew exactly what Birkenau and Auschwitz was. He knew exactly what happened. He didn't tell me that. Then came the second set of answers, the questions that I asked. So what happened with the civilians that were killed? I didn't even touch the term Auschwitz. Well, civilians that were killed, they were not civilians, they were guerrillas, they were terrorists. They didn't fight in uniform, so they, according to the Geneva Convention, they cannot enjoy any protection. We killed them. I asked him rhetorically, you tell me that a million plus children were fighting the mightiest army in the world, the ragtag Jews, Jewish victims that were guided into the crematorium, they, they were attacking you? Nonsense. And then the last phase was one evening he was completely blasted. And I asked him, tell me about the Holocaust. And he looked at me and said, you, your generation, you're soft. You're not hard. You're not battle trained. What we did for you to kill all the Jews, to get, they use the term killing, to clean the, the schmutz, the dreck, the dirt off. We should get a Nobel Prize, a Peace Nobel Prize, to making the world a better place to live. You guys are too weak. Now, that was the last straw that broke the camel's back of trust that I had with my father. I could not look up to him as a hero. I looked down to him as a common criminal. I didn't talk to him anymore, not much. And uh, I asked myself, what happened? I need to find out. And I, and I asked a former teacher of mine, a Jesuit priest, actually was at that time still my teacher. I said, what, how can I tell him the story? What can I do? I said, well, as a Catholic, you know, we need to make amends for those that were harmed personally by us. Or, or, or because of us. And I said, how can I make amends to people that I don't know? I don't know Jews. I never met a Jew. The only thing I heard about Jews is that they killed Jesus. And of course, was wrong. And he said, well, I'm belonging to the progressive wing of the Catholic Church. We're inviting from Israel Jews and Arabs uh, to come to Germany. We pay the trip and they learn from each other by vacationing and, and celebrating the, the day of freedom together. And I will send you as a, I sponsor you as, as, a, as my candidate to be the German representative. And so I met a young, young Jews. I was 19. They were 17, 18. That was before Google and Schmuggel. You actually had to talk to each other. And we had a good time together. And I must say, I liked the Israeli girls a heck of a lot. There was definitely not only spiritual needs that broke through. And one of the girls that I, that I touched base with her, so to say, and we liked each other, said, well, if you want to come and really want to make it serious, you have to come to Israel. I said, well, no problem. I was a good big Schwitzer. I was exaggerating. Yeah, sure. The problem is I had no passport and no money. Uh, during the two to three months following the departure, I worked in, the, in, in summer jobs, got some money, got a passport, and I traveled to Israel, not in the way that I recommended. I hitchhiked to Munich. In Munich, I took a train across the Alps to the Adriatic city of uh, Ancona. And from there, I took a ferry, uh, slept, sleeping on deck, definitely not a cruise, wild cruise. And in Piraeus, we reprovisioned. And I sent a telex to Haifa that I will come in that and that time. And I never forget the scenery when we arrived in Haifa in the early morning. The sun was rising. Suddenly, they saw the mountains of the Carmel Mountains rising like out, out of the sea. People were praying and uh, Jewish Jews praying the morning prayer, filling, and it was a very emotional moment. And on the other hand, when we came closer to the harbor, I asked myself, "Oy vey, if they find out that the name Volschläger, maybe somebody can identify the name Volschläger with some, somebody, something that my father did." I was afraid. On the other hand, I found her in the harbor, uh, behind the taxes and the, the custom service. She embraced me and said, "Let's go to my parents." We took a taxi up to the Neve Shanan on the Carmel Mountain, which was a working class neighborhood at that time. And her parents literally waited for me outside. Her father took my rucksack, her mother my bag that I was carrying, chit-chatting in Yiddish with me. I had no idea what they're talking about. And leading me into, into an apartment, which was a tiny little apartment. One room made for me and they all lived in the other room as a guest. And in the evening, they dished every food that, that I've never ate before, hummus, chatzilim, uh, couscous, and so on. And it was the chit-chatting with me in, in Yiddish and wanted to know, know more about me. And suddenly her father looked at me and said, look, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. I said, how do you talk, speak German? How did you learn it? I didn't say a word. He looked into my eyes, pulled up the sleeve, up on his left forearm and showed me the number tattooed. So that he found Auschwitz. He found Andernlager. And I was in Auschwitz and in other camps too. I was liberated and spent three years in Germany at this place person camp. And I had to learn not only German, 
I had to learn that not, not all Germans were monsters. But I want to know, are you, this generation, knowing everything they teach you, they make you aware of what happened? And I asked, answered him honestly, not enough. And here I was, and I was speechless because I was a young German for the first time in Israel, for the first time in the home of a Jewish family, for the first time in the home of Holocaust survivors. Her, her mother was also in a work camp. How how should I behave? And he noticed my despair and said, look, Bernd, I don't blame you, but I want to show you something. And two days later, he traveled with me to Yad Vashem in Yerushalayim, the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem. And he took me by his hand physically and walked me patiently to the exhibits and showed me everything. It took an hour and I broke down. Emotionally, physically, I, I was, I could not, I could not handle it. And I asked myself, how can these people, in a positive sense, these people that suffered so much by the hands of my people, treat me as a guest, treat me as a human being, rebuild their lives, rebuild an old nation anew. There's something unique I want to learn about these people in a positive sense. And way back to Germany, I pondered how, the question, how can I find Jews? In Germany, there were no, well, there were 25 to 28,000 Jews living in hermetically sealed off community centers in Frankfurt, Munich, and in um, Bamberg too and Hamburg, Berlin. And why were they were so isolated and, and protected by German police that had armored police carrier in front of the every Jewish community 24 hours a day? Because it was the time of terrorism. Palestinian terrorists roamed, roamed Europe, German terrorists, Italian terrorists, French terrorists. It was a war zone. And I, in my hometown, lo and behold, I found a little Jewish community uh, that were living up having a synagogue, a tiny, tiny little synagogue within an apartment building. It was only accessible from the backyard. And they called it the Israelitische Kultusgemeinde, the Israelite cultural community, not even a Jewish community. And I knocked at the door of this, and I found out where the entrance was. And an old man opened the door, it was a steel door, heavily, heavily guarded. And he looked at me, it was a tiny little man, didn't open the door. Was willst du? What do you want? And I said, well, I want to learn, I want to do, I, I ramble something, I don't know what. And he let me in, I said, come in. He thought I'm a student or the project. And we walked, I remember, to a black, dark corridor. There was a dim light in the corner, red light was dimly lit. And he asked him, what is this? This is the eternal light, Nel Tamit. And what are the black grave, the black stones on the wall with all the names engraved in them? So this is the names of the Bamberg Jews. These are the names of the Bamberg Jews who never returned from Theresienstadt. They all done, done, bad, 1200. And I walked, he led me into his office. It was a hot day. Uh, it was the windows closed, curtain drawn, no fi no air condition, no fan. And he took off his jacket and he had very white skin and the number tattooed on his left forearm stood out. I stared at it and he looked at me and said, well, that's, that's is Auschwitz. This is Auschwitz. I was in Auschwitz as a 14 year old, I survived. My name is Itzhak Rosenberg. I'm the chair of the Jewish community. He was tough as nails. And, uh, and I asked him, can I help you with something? Help? I, well, you can buy, a, can I give you a book, you can read it, we can talk about it. No, I read everything. I want to help. I said, you want to help what? I want to do something for you. So do something for us. Well, I know a good job. Shabbos Goy. I had no idea what Shabbos Goy or Shmoyan meant, but it's for those non-Jews listening to us. It's a non-Jew who serves in the Jewish community, an Orthodox Jewish community during the Shabbat from Friday night to Saturday night and does all the chores that an Orthodox Jew cannot do, not lighting fire, not preparing food, not carrying anything. So I was the handyman, so to say. And I said, what do you need to do? Well, I tell you on Friday, come at six o'clock. I was there at six o'clock, bull. 6.30, seven o'clock, 7.15, 7.30. It's like strolled into the, into the, uh, in the place to the building. I said, what are you doing here? He said, you should be at six o'clock. Are you German? You have to unlearn that. Six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. We don't take it that tight. So learn lesson number one. Don't be so German. It was this, it is wonderful humor, his cynical attitude. I loved him like a father. And uh, he showed me what to do. And he said, one important thing, when the Alte Kakas, that's what he said, when the Alte Kakas coming, the old man coming, we're about 30 Holocaust survivors to celebrate Shabbat. They ain't going to like you because you're the intruder. So just make yourself invisible. And so when I did one of my chores, I'd literally make myself invisible, invisible in the corner. And they were hickering and pickering. What must I go with? And they said, ah, forget about that. 
So I came for every Friday, every Saturday, every week, every month, every year, holidays. And I absorbed like a sponge, the mannerism, the language, the liturgy. And the closer I came to this family of choice, the more I separated myself from the family of origin. And it came to a big boch, as you call it. It were conflicts all the time with my father, but to point one out, it was the end of the conflicts, the conflict that ended all conflicts, was when Christmas fell on a Friday night. And Christmas in my mother's house as a Catholic was a big deal. I played like a, like a film in my mind. We had to go to the cathedral, the, and the Christmas mass, and then coming home, my mother served us lentil soup and the carp, and which symbolic food for Catholics in Germany. Then we were waiting for the bell to ring that my father decorating the Christmas tree in the big living room. And when he rang the bell, we could go in. And my father was standing next to a Christmas tree, larger than he was with real candles, but like this dark suit and the knight's cross around his neck, singing festive Christmas hymns. And I was not there. Well, needless to say, when I, when I came back from the from on Saturday evening, all hell broke loose. And I said, look, let's stop this Greek tragedy. I'm not going to sit at the same table with a man who has this bloodstained metal around his neck symbolizing murder. You're a murderer. You have no, you're celebrating the birth of Christ. You, how, how cynical is that? He looked at me and said, Raus, get out. Well, it was a little problem. In Kesef, kind guilt, no money. I was in the second to last year medical school and I did pretty well with the scholarship, but I still had some extra expenses. And I never took money from the community, nor what was it offered. And Itzhak must have noted that something is going on with me. He, he, he knew me after this five years that I was already there. And he must have told others because suddenly one member of the Jewish community approached me who never ever approached me. His name was Aaron. And Aaron, we didn't know, nobody in the community knew what happened to him, except, like Itzhak told me, that he found out on the Red Cross that it was in Auschwitz and lost everything. And uh, Aaron looked at me, approached me, said, you do Mr. Goy. Um, after five years, yeah, very perceptive, yeah. Your name is Bernd, thy name is Bernd, yeah. Hör mal zu, listen. Deine Schuhe und deine Jacke sind schmutzig. Du kaufst neue Sachen, new shoes and jacket is dirty, buy new stuff, gave me 100 mark. Well, that was a lot of money. And it was not true, I was not schmutzig, dirty. And I walked to, over to Itzak's apartment uh, office and said, Aaron gave me 100 mark. Aaron gave you 100 mark? He never gives any penny. Did you ask him for 200? That would be the opportunity. I said, no. I said, come on, sit down. Let me explain you something. Many of us physically survived, but not mentally. I barely survived both. I married a German woman, non-Jewish, and she built up a beautiful home from, of us. And she is wonderful. And I can finally found happiness. Aaron, nada, nothing. He's a black hole. He doesn't talk to anybody. But Aaron talked to me. And I knew later why, because he was going to die soon. And he told me a story that I just want to touch upon because it's too horrible. He was a member of a surviving man of a Sonderkommando. Sonderkommando in Auschwitz, when the Jews that guided the other Jews, the victims into the gas chamber, he said, take off your clothes. Don't forget to take the number they just identified with the clothing, the number. So keep this plastic that even after the shower, we can give you the right clothing. Closing the doors, and then the SS food cyclone B from the top. And he told me the crying and didn't stop for banging, didn't stop for at least 20 minutes. It was a horrible, horrible death. On the other side, the Sonder Commander opened the doors, equipped with gas masks, pulling out the bodies, burning the burning, incinerating the bodies, crushing the bones, and throwing the remnants in the pits right next to the crematorium. And then for 90 days, this uh, Sonderkommando, they became food, they got food, wine, women, and then they were gas after 90 days. The next group came in and Aaron survived. When Aaron died six months later, I was asked by, by Itzhak, we need, um, state, we are an Orthodox community, we need a Hever Kadisha burial society. We do not have enough able bodied men. You can help us. I said, I'm not a Jew. You're one of us. So we, buried, we washed the body. And during the night time, he died in the day before, had to be buried the next day. And they buried him. And when we are standing all at his graveside, Itzhak walked towards me and said, say the Kaddish. I said, Itzhak, I'm not his family. I'm, I'm not I'm not a Jew. I said, you are one of us. Don't forget. And I recited the Kaddish. And then something happened. I crossed the line. That was the line, the virtual line that I crossed from one world to the other world. 
And I told it's like I want to become a Jew. It's like looked at me, are you crazy? Is that not enough that we suffered? You can be a righteous person. You don't have to be suffering. You not wonderful man, don't don't do it. I said, I want to. I said, well, for that moment, I have plan B. I pay you to go to Frankfurt, meet that rabbi that I tell you. You stay in Frankfurt with the rabbi until the rabbi t drove, dies out his crazy ideas. And then you come back. Well, it took three days for the meeting with the rabbi. He, he agreed that he would teach me, but not convert me because he said, I will not convert Germans. So every one to two months, I met him personally in between. He talked on the phone. And I nudged him every time, every time that we together. I wonder when, when I'm mature enough to convert. He gave up in March, something in March 86, said, don't tell me again, don't ask me again. I will refer your case to the rabbinical court. They can handle it. But until you get there, you have to do some steps that are irrevocable and not necessarily give you the desired outcome. Like a little surgery I don't want to talk about, it's not a nose job. And it had to be done in, a, in an Orthodox community abroad in Basel in Switzerland, an Orthodox hospital. And six, three months later, I had to travel to Metz in France in the Hasidic community, Orthodox community, to immerse myself in a kosher mikveh, ritual bath. And then in December 1986, I just graduated from medical school the week before. I had a date with the rabbinical court, and I never forget that. It was like a court hearing. The black robes, the black hat, four rabbis sitting on the podium interrogating me, literally. And the chief rabbi after an hour said, look, let's stop everything. We know you know everything. We know you, you're a good boy. Why on earth is a German wants to become a Jew? I want to hear something that convinces me. And I convinced him. And uh, after a session that they had, I had to wait for an hour, they asked me to stand up and read the Theodat Gu, the conversion certificate in German and then in Hebrew and then in German. And it was a very, very emotional moment. And the rabbi, chief rabbi said, look, Bernd, your name is Ben Abraham that you cannot change. But your first name, you can change. You can choose. What is your name? I said, Bern. Do you know what it means? Something with a bear? Yeah, you're the bear slayer. Dov, Dubi. Dov Ben Abraham. Take it, it's free. Then he asked me, what do you want to do now? I said, I want to go to Israel. Why? I said, I want to give something back. I said, what do you want to give back? I cannot give back money because I'm, I have no money. I'm, I'm a young physician, so I don't have much to offer either. But I want to join the army and fight and give my life if necessary. And he said, this is a crazy idea. Well, I applied to the German, uh, to the Israeli embassy in Germany, in Bonn at that time, to the Jewish agency in Sochnut in Frankfurt, and within 30 days I was recognized, according to the law of return. Yeah, but we had a shortage of immigrants, because it went really fast. And on the 6th of January, 1987, I took a one-way ticket from Frankfurt to Tel Aviv and left Germany forever. The night before, I said goodbye to Richard uh, Itzak, goodbye to others, friends of mine. And Itzak told me, look, if you, do you intend to say goodbye to your parents? No. Do you know that the Jew, now that you bought the whole package, has to honor his parents regardless who they are? I said, I don't know. He said, well, I tried. I tried to visit my mother. My mother was crying. She knew what was going on. My father didn't allow me to come into the house. He was drunk, he yelling and screaming. And the next day I traveled to Israel. I was assigned to a kibbutz, I learned the language. Uh, six months later, I went, was assigned to a hospital in downtown Tel Aviv, Ichelov at that time, to get my German license up to Israeli par. And then one month later, I was drafted into the military because I gave up my German citizenship and wanted to become immediately an Israeli with all the necessary obligations. I did basic training, um, I did officer's course, and then I was dispatched to the, a place which called Beit El, it's next to Ramallah. And it was the first Intifada, October 1988, Arab uprising, starting in, in, in Ramallah. And we, and we all, we about 50, 40 to 50 soldiers, we were squeezed between the city of Ramallah and the settlement in Beit El. And we were in between, we got hit by each side. We were in full battle gear on a roll call in the morning when I arrived, the commanding officer already said, we need to be alert, bad things can happen. Everybody must be able to, to do what I tell him to do. And by the way, this is your doctor. His name is, I have to change his name. Name is, oh, call him Dov, Dr. Dov. And I stood there in full battle gear at my, at, it was a lieutenant uniform, a lieutenant with a lieutenant ranks. I had my gun loaded, pistol loaded, cartridges. We were equipped for World, World War Three. And I asked myself, if they find out that I'm a Nazi, son of a Nazi in drag, I mean, they will kick me out of it. I cannot, how, who can believe this story? And I decided not to talk about it. Well, of course, a huge, huge problem. 
I literally threw my life in a virtual closet, slammed the door shut and turned the key in the lock and tried to throw the key away. And for all those who not want to know about me, I told them the truth. I was, I'm from Germany. My name is Bernd Odov. I made Alian. I'm in the army and that's it. Well, these other details I omitted. Until, of course, my son Tal asked me the simple questions years later. Dad, who is my grandfather? And I told him the truth. And my son, oh, that's cool. Let me tell my friends. Do not tell your friends. Going to a Jewish school and tell them that your father, your grandfather was a Nazi is probably not a good idea. Well, to my luck, well, luck, literally, th three or four weeks later, they had a family history day in school. And everybody talked about their family coming from the house of David and hundreds of generations of rabbis. And my son raised his right hand and said, and my grandfather was a famous Nazi. It was a little problem. And I got called to the school. And the principal said, look, uh, Dr. Walschläger, you're a respected member of our community. Your son told us a Geschichte that your father was a Nazi. I mean, what drugs does he smoke? And my son doesn't smoke any drug. I needed to get him out of the hot lot. It was me. I told him the story of our family. And the rabbi who joined us, are you sure that this is, that you don't want to talk about it? Yeah, you will. Come with me. It's good for the nisham, good for the soul. And so for the first time in the school, I talked about my life and something happened that the rabbi predicted. The weight was lifted off my shoulders and I asked myself the question, why did I never close the circle of life? I have to continue living by making closure in of this part of my life, which is still open. So my son and I, we traveled to Germany in the winter of 2003. I visited my parents in the place and knew that, that they were residing the graveyard, both were dead. And ironically, and that is not atypical for Jewish communities in the in the 19th, 18th century in Germany and Bavaria, they were living together with non-Jews on the countryside and they're burying the dead on the same in the same graveyard, divided by a wall. And so my parents' grave is one row parallel to the wall, separating the Jewish from the Christian cemetery. With, and you see Jewish gravestones almost defiantly cast in the shadow to the other side. And I told my son, this, this is your grandparents' grave. I don't know what to tell you, but they still, in death even, are in, residing in the shadow of history. They never stepped out of the shadow. I stepped out, looked back, and made a commitment as a young German. I will make everything happen that it will never happen again. We cannot let that happen again. And as such attitude I am, I have, I share my story, not because I'm a cool guy, I don't have enough ego left without it. But to tell people, one person can make a difference if this one person is committed to make a difference. Don't judge any person from any ethnic or religious group for what the entire group has done. Find out how you can create relationship with the individuals. Because as individuals, we are a lot the same. We don't belong to tribes. We belong to the human mankind and womankind, so to say. And we need to learn to talk to each other. Take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth and listen to each other. This is my message. And of course, I also got the message that my father and Bobby never wanted to share with me, that hatred is not this dark matter of the universe that we, uh, that we cannot explore. No, hatred is something that we create by words, using words of hatred. And if these words of hatred left unchallenged, they fall on the fertile ground on the mind of others, sprouting into deeds. And if these deeds prevail, habits will form. If you don't counter the habits, then a convention, then char characters will arise and will th thrive on this on this hate speech. And if these char characters prevail, they will set social norms. And these social norms make it normal that you can kill other people, harm other people. The Germans killed new. For them, it was okay to kill Jews. They knew everybody knew what happened to the Jews. But the norms they were created from a simple word to the horrendous uh, what happened later, that was a single word that of hatred which made its way to, to, towards the history. We have to stop hating each other. It's very easy to hate each other, to de demonize somebody. First we de-individualize them, Abraham and Sarah. Then we get, Jews don't have a, a name. Then we depersonalize them. These are not human beings. And then demonize them, ready to kill them. That we have to stop. We have a world with enough conflict and we have enough time, hopefully time left to enjoy our lives. And even when we preserve our, stand up to our opinions, that's okay, but listen to others too. That's the message that I send. And as a last sentence, when I tell people, against all odds, change is possible.
So make it make it happen. Thank, Dr. Volschlager, Thank so you. I will I will say this. Um, we have lots of fantastic guests on this show. Um, and I'm not saying this to be a gushing person, but you are, you know, my new greatest hero. <laughs> so I have a I have a kind of question okay. comment, and this is something that Yitzhak Rosenberg asked you. You know, they say that God doesn't give a person more than they can handle. But it seems like God dumped a hundred lives on you to overcome so many things in your life. So moving past, once you decide that you want to find more about Jews, first you said, I'm going to go to Israel. Well, you could have ended it right there because instead of hopping on a plane, it took you four days to get there, going from this train to that train to, to, to uh, a hitchhiking to a ferry. And then you come back and then you meet, you meet with this, these Jews and then you're a Shabbos guy. And, and every step along the way, you could have said, you know what? I like these people. I want to remain friends with them. And I understand from what you just said in reading your book that when you said the Kaddish, that was like the turning point for you. But before you got there, there were so many hurdles in your way that you could have said, you know what? I love the Jewish people. I'm sorry what the, Ger the Germans did, but I'm going to be a good guy, and I'm always going to be friends with the Jews. Why did you keep going? Because I felt a deep-rooted commitment that I have to do something. If not, not because I wanted to be special, but for me personally, that I could not live my, continue living my life in a way that, that I left it before because I found so many things out that shocked me, and specifically shocked me because it was happened with my father, in the, done by my father, and it was, you have only one father in the, in the world. And if this father is not accessible and not there anymore, you, you find other avenues to live your life with value system that you have to recreate because my father, the only value system that I learned from him, or most of it, was hatred. Right. Hatred. Baylor? But I actually, if you asked me this question about going on, hmm. I remember... I was in a in one of it was in it was in September two nineteen ninety when the month before Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, uh, war was in the was definitely in the in the books, and we were mobilized reserve duty. I was just two months out of the army, in a regular service. I was rec recalled into the army, and we stationed on the border to Syria, Lebanon, and Israel in this triangle, a little bit north south from the uh, Sea of Galileo, the Kinneret. And uh, we, we knew that this is an entry point for terrorists coming from the other side, specifically from the Syrian side. And every night we had some Haligali, we call it. The, first of all, the Jordanian office, Jordanian called our commanding officer and said, we have a suspicious movement. Can you t they're coming to your border. We, we, will, we will hunt them, but you, you take them. So there was, a, there was a cooperation and every night we was something else. So we were to exhausted. One, one night you were actually with no calls and one of my soldiers, we were both in the reserve duty, looked at me and said, you know, I heard that you know, well, I suspect that you were not born as a Jew. I said, well, you're right. So you became Jewish? Yeah. Are you crazy? And then you came to Israel voluntarily on Aliyah as a Goy who became a Jew? Are you uber crazy? And then, if, then you fight with us and risk your life. You're crazy. You're one of us. We're all crazy. So I joined the, the, Isra the Israeli mentality. And uh, I fell in love with, with, with my country. And I, I defended it. That, that is my country and always will be my country. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Walschlager, you've been speaking in front of uh, Jewish groups worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, not just about your personal history, but uh, to confront the ways hatred is confronted. Can you share a bit about your ideas? My ideas about fighting hatred? Yeah. I have, I have actually, I made it a point uh, to talk to people that we normally don't talk. Palestinians, I have quite a few good friends. And um, to understand how they tick and they understand how I tick. And um, I make it a point to listen. Sometimes it's very, very difficult because the, the, some of the ideas are horrendous. Uh, for example, I was in the meeting that was in the early 80s, uh, uh, in the early, in the late 80s, um, with the, in an Arab village in Israel, and uh, I, I was obviously the only non-Jew in that room. There were like 30 or 40 uh, Palestinian young men, 
And, uh, and I told them my story. And they said, you became a Jew to serve the world. To, to, you, you're not our friend anymore. I said, look, if we don't talk to each other, we're doomed to die together. And if, if it's difficult, we need to talk. We need to communicate. And I don't agree with everything that you say. For example, well, Dolph is your name. You, the, the Germans did so many good things like killing the Jews. That's great. So we don't have to kill so many afterwards. We take care of the rest. I said, well, let me tell you one thing. You're Semites. I'm a Semite. We joined the Semite tribe. And Hitler was an anti-Semite. So you will be on the next train track, on the tracks, train to Auschwitz too. And he looked at me. Well, I never looked at it like that, but Israelis are Nazis. So they're not Nazis. So, I mean, it sounds like a trivial conversation, but made it, making it a point to, to talk in, of course, safe environment, God forbid, unsafe. It is easier to hate than to talk. And you don't have to agree at all with what the other side says. And I, for example, denying uh, Israel the, the right to exist. I said, if you deny a country the right to exist, why should we give you the right to uh, run your country, have a country for you? And then sometimes I bring up the point, which is in conversation. I'm actually very like you. I'm a refugee. My mother was ex evicted from her home in Sudetenland. I'm the first generation of refugee. They didn't put me into swallowing this, this dirty, infect, infested camps that you, that you sent your refugees. We were integrated in German society because what you lost in war, you lost. No, that, that didn't go well, the argument, but they, they pondered the question, so you're a refugee too. Yeah, I'm a refugee, and I have the same right to, get, to claim my home, which you do, but it ain't going to happen because the war happened, and the only thing what you can do is living together, trying to make the best out of it. So conversations, as, as difficult as it is, one should also take in consideration that Israel is the only country in the world that make an effort to integrate and live together with non-Jews, i.e. Arabs. 20% of our population are Muslims. And Israel, it's difficult. It is the blocks on the road, there are setbacks, but we talk to each other. Actually, uh, Ar um, Sunni Arabs, some, some of the villages uh, serve in Israeli army, Bedouins serve in Israeli army, Druze serve, serve in Israeli army. I was in the first, in the second Lebanon war in 2006, in the first units that came, that reached the border and got, were the Druze units. And one Druze man, uh, officer died and was uh, on the field. And we visited his family in a Druze on the, I made it the point to say, you're very loyal to, to the state of Israel and that you sacrifice your son for the state. Makes me feel that, that I belong to you and you belong to us. And to right. be, you deal with mensch, of course, there's also the dark side, but um, make a long, short answer, a long winding answer, long, short question, long winding answer. Talk to people, each other. Right. Try. Right. Dr. Volschlag, I want to go back to when you were younger and you make your first trip to Israel. And so, again, I know you went, you were on a journey, a spiritual journey, and you also, you spent time with Vered's family, the family that, uh, the Jewish family that you fell in love with, and then you went and met with your friend Khalid, uh, who was in Ramallah, and you spoke about how his family also took you and embraced you. You went to the Kotel, and you met a Kabbalist on your way out, who uh, you know grabbed you and spoke to you about your neshama, and then you go back home to Germany. Can you tell me, how did you process everything that, I mean, you, you did in, in four or five days, what people don't do in a month? So how did you process um, all that when you got back home? Well, I'm always a curious and I will always be a curious person. That's number one. And I always ask question why. And until I get the answer, I, I have to find the answer myself. So I'm driven, not necessarily because that I'm manic, but I'm driven by the truth. And of, obviously, I'm also driven to clean my soul from what my, being my father's son. Because my father was a murderer. I was clear, clear cut. I actually... If just about two years ago, and I was two and a half, year, three years ago, and I was in Bamberg giving lectures. A, the military historian that worked with me showed up at one of the lectures and brought me him a it's attaché suitcase, this metal attaché suitcase, and he said, "This is for you." I said, "What is a bomb?" I said, "No, it's not a bomb." And he opened the attaché suitcase, and inside were ripped pieces of Torah scrolls wrapped in newspaper. I said, "What is that?" 
Well, Bern, this is when your father's late tank mechanic died in in uh, in Germany just a few years ago. His family wanted the son of the commander, me, to have this. And I said, what does it mean? I said, well, when your father's units maraudered the countryside and killed people, and then specifically in Jewish villages, in Jewish city, in small villages, they burned down the synagogue, but before that, they took out the Torah scrolls, soaked them in water, this parchment it congested very well, was soaked with water, it was a perfect isolating material, insulating material for German tanks in a cold Russian winter. So my father not only flagrantly violated all rules of war, he also knew exactly what happened and what is to He, My father was directly and indirectly involved in, until I find my, my peace, I, and I found it, I'm moving forward to find the truth. Okay. Bela, if you have know, another question? One, one last question. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Walschleiger, um, has your mission had any impact on your career as a doctor? Yes and no. Actually, I became a doctor because, well, I'll be very honest, I wanted to be independent. That was one point. I knew that uh, I wanted to have a profession that allows me to practice literally everywhere if, if licensed. Um, but I also want to be a doctor in order to give something and participate in in, in Israel in, in, in research, which I, which I did and I'm doing. Um, yeah, that was definitely influenced by that. I, I work, even if I would have been a, an economist, I probably would do the same thing. But mm. I chose in my mentality to be a doctor. Therefore, um, and I'm sure that is influenced by by my moral the development of new morals and ethical behaviors. And uh, that I found so typically reflected in a book from Aristoteles um, and books like the, the Shulchan Aruch from Rabbi Karo, which describes that one, even intellectual person, specifically intellectual person, has to abide by ro roles and be a model for others. I never had a problem declaring that I'm a Jew um, because it would, uh, I never encountered, well, I encountered in my practice lately uh, some remarks like, oh, you people only are for the money, or when people see my masseuse at the doors and pictures of Israel, are you one of those Jews? Well, needless to say, they're in the wrong place. We, but I'm fighting now the thri unfortunately thriving anti-Semitism by talk talking to people that we cannot go back to this hate speech, because we are the canary in the coal mine Jews, and when the canary dies, you will die too. Right. Okay. Okay. Dr. Walschlager, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Definitive Wrap and for Thank all you. that you are doing, being the voice for the over 6 million victims who were forever silenced. Thank you to our audience for tuning in. And I urge everyone to buy the book, A German Life Against All Odds, Change is Possible. Thank you to vinnews.com for hosting our show. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks for listening to The Definitive Wrap with your hosts, Bela Sebro and Alan Skorsky. Be sure to tell your family and friends they also can listen to The Definitive Wrap on Apple Music, Spotify, Google Play, and your favorite streaming service. See you next time on The Definitive Wrap.